welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. This is Joel Simmons, and this is my first podcast for the year 2024. And I'm very excited to have a friend uh, and farmer. Uh, and and one of uh, uh, a friend from way back when, uh, Vincent, I think, and uh, and and a brother from another mother, as you used to say, uh, and a very close friend of Jerry Brunetti, uh, who of course everybody knows was our founding partner here. And Vincent, I I've been excited to have you on for a long time. You're one of my favorite people on this earth. You're actually I didn't realize this until I think the last time you came out this way, but I didn't realize you were. Well, actually, I did know this, but uh, you were born and raised in Philadelphia. Yeah, born and raised in beautiful downtown Lansdowne. Oh, very yeah, not very far from where I'm sitting right now, actually. Yeah, so well, not Lansdale, Lansdowne, right? Lansdowne, I know exactly where it is. Oh, okay, yeah. Upper Darby, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I'm in uh, Lambertville right now in New Jersey. Oh, okay, where okay. I'm sitting you and uh, and chatting to you from where my home is, and our right. office is in Easton, as you well know. Yes. Uh, I think I, I don't know when I met you and I was trying to figure this out the other day, but I know it was with Jerry and it probably was at one of the many acres uh, events that, right. that you and I went, went to over the years. But Absolutely. Uh, yeah, tell me the story. Uh, and you just started to tell this, but I hadn't heard this story, but I want to hear the story of how you met Jerry Brunetti. OK, well, uh, rewind a little bit, you know, back in 1980, I was I, I went to a um a store in Kalui here on Maui. And I and didn't mention that, but Vincent is a farmer uh, and has been uh, uh, on the Hawaii Farmers Union. He started the Hawaii, a Hawaii Farmers Union, but you've been in Hawaii for most of your life now, right? Yeah, 1978, I moved here. Okay, so when I was five years old, you moved out. <laughs> <laughs> and, a bit, and of, so bit of a I, lie, but that's all right. <laughs> so I went into uh, this organic amendment place in downtown Maui, Kahului, Maui, and um, an organic amendments, you know, so I went in because I was gardening at the time here at where I live. And um, there was a table and a couple chairs there. And on the table was a Acres USA publication. Oh, there you go. So yes, yeah, so I picked it up and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Loved it, you know, so I, I, I became a subscriber and reading it, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, fast forward to uh, starting the farm in 1994 with my wife, Irene. Um, and uh, I said to her one day, I said, you know, they talk about these conferences on the mainland. Yeah. And I, I'd really like to go one day, you know. So finally, you know, in 1997, I was, um, uh, I, I called up to go to the conference and, uh, I hung up after I registered and I said, looked at my wife and, and she said, what's wrong? I said, I just signed up for this farmer's con. There's going to be all these farmers there. I mean, we've been kind of farming for the past four years, but, you know, to me, farming was like acres and, right, you know, big, acres big USA, right, you know, and so, um, uh, so I went and, and I got into, uh, and it was in Kansas city and I was in the lobby and there was a, at the hotel, there was a restaurant right there in the lobby and after I checked in, I was standing in line and this, this elderly man turns around and says to me, uh, are you here for the conference? I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you join us for lunch? And it was Chuck Walters. And, oh, wow. Yeah. The, the big cheese of Acres the USA. Cheese, right. He was with the guy. I forget his name, but he had a radio show in Texas. And, oh, I know exactly who you mean. I don't remember his name either, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Right. And so uh, after we had lunch, Chuck. Uh, gave me a invite to the speakers uh, party because I came from so far. And, um, and so that's when, uh, you know, I got to kind of get on the inside there with the folks at Acres. But the Saturday night keynote, I get on the elevator and um, another guy gets on the elevator in the next floor. And uh, I see he has a conference badge, you know, and I and so he says, are you here for the conference? I go, yeah. And, and I said, uh, and, and I see you are too. He said, yeah. He said, I'm uh, giving the keynote. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, what are you going to talk about? He said, I really have no idea. <laughs> that's when I realized you know, I need to be around this guy. Yeah. Oh. And that was Jerry. That was Jerry Brunetti. Yeah. And, you know, it brings it brings a lot of emotion up to me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, which is good. Yeah, and I know the feeling, believe me. I mean, I, I talk to the man <laughs> almost every day of my life still to this day. He's nine years past, but uh, but it's yeah. still, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, I, I, I went to many, many acres uh, conferences with Jerry or around Jerry. And uh, I remember one time I had taken Lisa Kiefer, who was, who's been working with us for uh, Jerry and me for 26 years. And and we walk around the corner and we hear, psst, psst. And I'm like, what is that? And I look around and there's Jerry and he's waving us over. And I'm like, what do you, he's like hiding in a corner. He goes, we got to get out of here. I said, what's the matter? Did you do something wrong? He goes, no, if we don't get out of here now. I'm going to be surrounded. I mean, he was Jesus <laughs> at these right. meetings. And we he right. literally had to sneak out to go out to dinner. And, uh, yes. and, 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 you know, you know, it's funny. Literally, I, I, literally Joel, I, I was the guy who used to go into the middle of the group that surrounded him after his talk <laughs> to Jerry. We got dinner reservations in a half hour, man. We got to get going now. I, I was literally the one to pull yeah. him out, you know? Yeah. And I think I probably did you read that the book illusions. You ever read the book illusions? I have not. No, I know Richard of it. Bach? Yeah. Pick I it know up. of it. Yeah. It's a one night read. Okay. Yeah. But the, the point being is that it so much, it, it related to a lot uh, to how people saw Jerry yeah and um there was a in the beginning in the pro, in the beginning of the book um it's at the table set that these creatures live at the bottom of the river and they're holding on for dear life not to be pulled away by the flow right and one day this creature said you know what there's got to be more to life than this so right. i'm just gonna let go and find out and they're no, no don't do that you'll be crushed and tumble in the rocks and you'll be killed and all this well he didn't listen and he and he he uh, floated to the top and of course got tumbled and all around and everything and ended up getting into the flow he didn't die he didn't get crushed right and he's in the flow and he's like wow this is amazing and next thing you know downstream there's another colony of creatures like him looking up and going oh my god look one like us but he's flying you know well that's how they kind of saw from my point of view they saw jerry yeah. like he like he was some kind of messiah you know where he was just a regular guy yeah he I really mean, was a pentium brain yeah. he had a pentium for a brain yeah. but just a regular guy and and it's really sad to me that people jerry was was sicker than a lot of the people that he was making well yes he you was I mean? and you know they were just like like parasites and it really used to upset me because they wouldn't slow down enough to to just go wow this guy's a human being that needs attention and care and yeah. love and you know and so it's one of those things but i tell you i i just posted something on my facebook page of a talk that he had 10 a 10 minute talk before our conference that we put on here on maui and it was an amazing 10 minute like like if people want to know about jerry Bernetti, listen to that 10 minutes because yeah. he talks about mitochondria and he just articulates it down to A, B, C, D, E, F, G to where people could understand it, no matter what your you know position is in life. And uh, he was just really great in that way. You know, I, I worked with him for 35 years. Uh, I knew him longer than that, but I worked with him. You know, you know, he and I started Earthworks together and almost every day we'd sit down. I, he'd give me an hour dissertation about something I didn't know about. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and that lasted literally till the last few months of his life when he couldn't really communicate. I mean, it would get me to the point of being pissed off where like, I'd be like, when do I get to know something? When, when do I get to be, you know, when, how come some of this isn't like kind of just osmotically coming into me as, but, but it has obviously, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here without the man and earthworks wouldn't exist without him. And, and I think we've done an awful lot of good to help a lot of people and all of it came from from you know really getting to know jerry i don't know if you've ever heard this story you probably haven't and i don't know if you ever knew charles flat charles owned um a winery just up the hill from where jerry lived and uh -huh. i was the county extension agent and oh, wow. and i used to spend uh I, charles was one of the first people i got to know and i you know i moved into a new area i didn't know anybody and i i was working pretty hard and 
uh, I got to know Charles and his wife Elaine on this farm, and and I love the whole concept of of viticulture. I I became a viticulture specialist actually as an extension agent, but I would go up to his farm on Friday afternoon, and my huge I had this uh, you know uh, something you know Galaxy five hundred that they gave me that was as big <laughs> as a house, and I'd drive this thing up to his farm on Friday afternoon it would be my last stop, and I'd be there when he got home from teaching school, and I'd be sitting out there drinking wine with his wife on his lounge chair. And he goes, I don't get it. I come home from a long day, a week of work. And there's my county agent sitting there drinking my wine with my wife oh, on my it. lounge chair. And I said, yeah, but I got an extra glass here for you. So <laughs> we sit there until all hours. And then finally, one day he turns to me and goes, look, there's this guy down the hill. And honestly, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but I think you will. <laughs> So I, I want to introduce you to him. And and this gentleman happened to be a guy named Jerry Brunetti. And I, I you know, and, and he came up Never to the house. Story. Yeah, he That's came up to the story. house one time and we instantly hit it off. And in 1988, we decided that uh, I didn't want to be doing what I was doing. So I came on, joined the force and we built uh we built earthworks and uh, we're still running like crazy people. So Love let it. me let me talk to you a little bit about what you're doing no, on, excuse on me, Joel, one, one before I forget about it. The, the the key was when Fred would introduce Jerry, yeah. Fred Walters would introduce Jerry, forgetting more than I'll ever know. Right. And it's true. You know, love it. You know, I used cool. to go, uh, you know, when when and I'll, I'll tell you know, when he was when he was his last year, he was really fairly ill. And I would go every Saturday afternoon. I, I had a young son. So I would do what we called, you know, boys day out in the morning with my son. And then I would, you know, take him home and get in the car and drive out and spend the afternoon at Jerry's house. Now, some days he was passed out or, you know, unconscious or, or, or you know, right. or sleeping. I mean, I, I don't mean this to sound ill, but, sure. uh, but, you know, other days we would sit there and we would just have hours of conversation, but the days that he was, you know, kind of out of it, uh, I would go to the next room, which was his library. And I would be like a kid in a candy store. And I'm like, I think yeah. I still, and I hope that the Brunetti family doesn't hear this. I think I still have probably a good box or two of books that I might've borrowed and forgotten to bring back. But uh, I have a library. I mean, Jerry, would go to, he would go to acres every, every year, come home with literally a case of books right? and, and then find things that were so obscure. So he would read them. And he would, read them. he would read them. <laughs> Not only would he read them, he would devour them and he devour would interpret them. And then and, retain and, it. And then and retain, retain it. it. And then get excited about it. And, you know, I mean, you could always tell when Jerry got a new book because we got a new, we got a new direction. That's right. We got something to talk about. We got something to do. You know, we're going to change this. And, yeah, it was, and, you know, it was really quite wonderful because it was, you know, I mean, we were young in our, our career and right. we're building products and, you know, and, and, you know, still to this day, the products that we've built at Earthworks, and I know this is true of the products at Agrodynamics, but they're so far ahead of their time because of the work that Jerry put into. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. a lot of my products will have 35 raw materials in them, which are, you know, I talk to people, you know, now that Jerry's no longer around, I talk to people and you're like, how the hell do you get that many things in a jug? I have no idea. Jerry did it and he yeah. did it through, yeah. you know, I, again, we're fortunate enough to have Lawrence Mayhew on our team right on. as a humic acid specialist. Beautiful man. Yeah, he's, he's wonderful. He's very funny and he's very good. Uh, but it, it, you know, all of this brain trust that we've, we've been uh, fortunate to have has allowed us to build some unique things that have helped people, you know, do really good things in the field. So it's been, you know, I mean, like I said, I, I've said this a thousand times on, on our podcast, but I wouldn't be here without this man. And I, I'm, that's why I'm so thrilled to have you, but I do want to go back a little bit. I just want to get into a little bit about what you've done over your career. Uh, and then we'll come back and tell some more Jerry sure. stories, but how did you get to Hawaii and why did you get to Hawaii? First of all, well, a friend, a friend of mine that I met in Philadelphia one summer, um, he was there, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, from originally from Wisconsin, I believe he was from Wisconsin. Anyhow, he was in Philadelphia working uh, and uh, I met him through uh, being on a softball team. Uh, ah. And he was in a, um, he trained on the big island of Hawaii uh, for the Peace Corps. Oh, back wow. in the, yeah, and he went to Thailand, spent a few years in Thailand and Peace Corps. Well, he, he wanted to go back to Hawaii to possibly 
uh, work in Hawaii as a preschool teacher, alternative preschool. Yeah. He wanted, you know, he figured Hawaii would be the place. And um, so he came back to Hawaii after I met him that summer and um, uh, told me the following, you know, winter, you got to come check this place out. And I did. And being Sicilian, it resonated with me, you know, in my DNA that I have an island in my DNA. It just resonated. Right, exactly. And so. Um, what year was I, this? That was 1978. Okay. I moved to, I moved here uh, in November of 78. So you just picked up and moved 8,000 miles away. Yeah, 5,000, 5, but still, you know, what's a couple thousand? Yeah, exactly. Right? It's pretty damn uh, far away. Yeah, you know, uh, being in, from an Italian family, you know, they're going, what? You know, you might as well say I was going to move to the moon. Yes. And, exactly. uh, and there was, uh, you know, but I was at a place where I needed to to move do something either i was going to stay in philadelphia or or you know uh move to hawaii and that was so it was an easy decision in that respect because i really that hawaii resonated with me so how did you get into the whole farming world well that's a good question i you know i was a decorative painter by trade that's what i in I philly went, yeah i was i went i went to i this never trade knew that school. yeah i went to this trade school um, for I wanted to go for horticulture, and it was a free school. It was a, after high school. It was a three-year trade school, and it was the only way you could get in there is through scholarship. And uh, and so uh, there was no room in. Uh, well, actually, they didn't have, they didn't even have a horticulture uh, 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 part of the school at that point. But I went in there wanting to uh, uh, wanting to you know further my interest in you know plants and and working the land kind of thing. Because when I was seven years old, I grew lettuce out in my front yard and cut it and brought it in. Thanks to my grandfather, he taught me. Right. Uh, brought it in, they gave it to my mother and then I was blown away that it was on the table for dinner, you know? And so I connected the dots when I was seven years old in, the, in, in that value. But um, uh, so I went to this trade school, ended up the only shop, the only position I could get in uh, was in decorative decorative shop uh, decorative painting shop and I so I did that and uh, learned uh, how to do marbleizing and wood graining and things like that faux fit finishes yeah and so that's what I brought with me to Hawaii as you know pushing my fortune your skill set yeah yeah as my skill set <clears throat> and um, so I, I I was able to get into this house uh, this three-bedroom house I was renting and next to it was an empty lot but that empty lot was being cultivated by somebody else, like a, a little bit, not the whole lot, just a little bit. And but, but the, the neighbor, and he had a he had a fence, but he had a, a door in the fence. And I'm going, yeah. well, if this is his lot, why is why does he have a fence? You know. And so I asked the landlord about it, and she said, oh yeah, that's my property. I said, well, geez, I'd like to cultivate it. You know. Well, I have to charge you fifty dollars more a month. I said, I'll give you a hundred. So <laughs> it was great, you know, that I was able to garden at that extent like a whole lot you know and i just loved it and um and hawaii you know year round growing and all that and so um uh that was my true love uh even though the way i was paying bills was uh, uh you. you know painting yeah and so one day my wife when she was pregnant with our little girl uh was craving sunflower greens and she went into the, the health food store she bought them all off the shelf came home, grinded them all. And uh, and then, you know, the next day she went back and there was none there. I mean, a farmer never got back to recharge. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, right? And, Nobody buys these things. I don't need to go oh, back yeah, Not that fast, right? And so um, I said, what do you keep buying them for? I could grow them. She was like, why aren't you growing them? You know, so that's basically, it was our little girl. Because I didn't think I could farm because I didn't have land or equipment. Like I right, said earlier. Right. You know, I always thought a farmer was like, you know, you need a lot of land and uh, lots and Jerry, of money, equipment. Yeah, right. All that, you know, and I lived on a ninety five hundred square foot lot. And so we ended up 30 years. Fast forward 30 years ago, we started and we were making six figures on twenty five hundred square feet right now. Wow, you know, that's unbelievable, really. Legal yeah. legal crops too. Yeah, and, yeah. And I was going to ask you that. Was, yeah, that's Jerry true. put it in his book, you know. And I think back then we were fifteen hundred square feet when he wrote when he featured us in his book. 
yeah uh, our farm but we're the we're the I, I tell people we're the largest smallest farm in hawaii you know what are you um, growing sunflower microgreens sunflower <coughs> excuse me pea radish and wheatgrass and where are you selling it four crops all on the island it all gets all sold here to and, to, uh, to restaurants health food stores restaurants hotels you know anywhere uh that uh that the product is marketed you know can be marketed and we have people come to the farm pick up and chefs come to the farm and pick up and, and it's an urban farm too which is really really and how big is it 2500 square feet so that's there's, unbelievable there's, yeah there's 15 there's the 1700 square feet in um growing area yeah 400 square feet in compost because every flat that we cut we we compost and and uh, remineralize and reuse and then there's 400 square feet processing so it's set up like a u-turn business we grow from the front to the back in a green in a shade house and then we do a u-turn into our processing area and then after they get you know cut clean bagged they go into the chill and I, I set it up to where there's two two doors in the chill. So when we go in the chill, you know, our orders are there, we go out the other side. So it's just a U-turn. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. The, yeah, it's set up really nicely. And it, it's cool because it's kind of, I, I tell people it's kind of good that I didn't have a lot of land because I was able to make it work on a postage stamp. You know, right, I just right. had that much, knowing I had that much to work with, it really helped me, you know, uh, uh, fine tune it in that this respect. isn't the original lot you were talking about that you moved to yeah yeah this is, is the it? original oh yeah. so you haven't moved so you moved there and you, you got stuck well i was up country <laughs> for a year i was up i was about i was a different place for about a year but yeah after that i was uh been here that's and, a great story it really is a great i mean well, really after can... moving five thousand miles you know it's yeah. like i didn't want to move anymore <laughs> i don't blame you. yeah it's a long haul carrying everything on your back across yeah, the that's right that's right <laughs> I, we have we have a mutual friend that I think came from the East Coast out to Hawaii, didn't he? But he was being chased by the by the police and 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 the drug runners, wasn't he? I mean, I think you know. Who, I won't mention his his name's Hugh. You know Hugh. Oh, huge! That's yeah, huge, yeah, huge. Yes. So I, Jerry used to tell me that story, and I'm and I met. Well, Hugh. he's funny. Yeah, he was a great yeah. guy. Actually, that's he a came. Whole... That's he a whole came, podcast right yeah. there. <laughs> it should be actually. <laughs> one time, one great story with huge. Jerry and I, I took the guys when, you know, Jerry was speaking at our conferences and we can talk about that. But um, I would, from Maui, I would take all the speakers to Big Island and we would have, we would have the same kind of, you know, scaled back, but just for Hughes community, we'd have all the speakers present. So Jerry and I are sitting in the living room and we're just musing. And Jerry, I said to Jerry, Jerry, you smell what I smell? And he said, yeah. And I said, God, it smells, you know, Pakalolo, man, you know, I, I just, I can't figure out where it's coming from. Well, here on the on the table, right in front of us, there's a flower, a flower arrangement. Oh, all these great. old tropical flowers, and in there are buds. Use, <laughs> use, putting, you know, buds, and so it was kind of funny, you know. And his his wife would, you know, get on him about doing that, but you know, Hugh Johnson, he's he's a beauty. That guy, one of the most interesting men on the planet, truly. Yeah, he, he really yeah. is a fascinating guy. I remember he came out. Uh, he came out the last, you know, while well, Jerry was really pretty ill. I have, uh, we had dinner one night. I got, right. actually got Hugh that's came right. and we got Jerry out, which was one of the last times oh, he ever really went out to, to uh, break bread with us. But, and right. we, I have a couple great pictures of the two of them sitting there, oh, they, good. you know, and, and Hugh is about this big around, you know, he's, yeah. he's, not, he's not a huge man really, but he's a great guy. And this, his yeah. story was great, but uh, how he got out to Hawaii. But th so, so how did you get from, doing this little uh postage stamp farm to becoming you know on the board of directors of ag and starting the farmers union i mean you you really been very active i mean yeah, you know, go fear. it was never my aspiration i um, wouldn't think so oh no it, you know it, it, it so give me give me your resume you've been you've been you were on the hawaii organic farmers association you started the union give, walk through some of the things that you've done here yeah, so 1998, we had our after I was president of Hawaii Organic Farmers Association, went to Acres, came back, and I said, "We got to get these guys here." And people here were like a bit miffed. They go, "Well, we got a lot of really great organic farmers, and they could be present." I said, "But they're not talking the the, the rap that these guys are talking. Yeah, you know, balancing stories. the soil, and you know, <laughs> all that. I, I'm not hearing that here." And so. Um, 
And so that's when we had our first soil health conference. Bob Schaefer, who lives in on Big Island. Oh, I didn't Rock. know that. Yeah, yeah. Bobby the Schaefer. lived out there. He, he spoke there in 1998. And um, it was really wonderful. It was our first soil health conference. And then um, in, so fast forward to 2001, um, my wife and I uh, started uh, Maui Aloha Aina Association. And Aloha Aina in Hawaiian means uh, uh, love the land that feeds. Mm, so there's two sayings right. here in Hawaii, Malama Aina, which means care for the land, and Aloha Aina, uh, love the land that feeds. Aina and is so, land? Aina is land, yeah. yeah. And so um, here we are, my wife and I farming, you know, two children, um, not feeling as healthy as we wanted, we felt we should be feeling eating all this organic food. Going, what's up with this, you know? And so we started an organization to explore this relationship between our bodies and the soil and the oh, food wow. that's grown in the soil. And that's why it was called Body and Soil. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, Jerry, after meeting Jerry at Acres and, and after him getting to know me and me, me getting to know him, it was like, we started Maui Aloha Aina to have Jerry come here, right. you know, I mean, good, good reason. It was, yeah. It was such a, it was such a uh, hand in glove, you know, exploration because he was so big picture and was able to tie, tie uh, you know, tie, uh, tie it all together, yeah. you know, between that relationship. And so, yeah. Well, you know, so it's, funny, was, it's funny you say that because I remember early on when I started working with him, I mean, he always made the analogies which really made it simple uh, between the body and the soil. Right, and, and, you know, right. and, and, you know, and, you know, of course, Chuck Walters was doing that, but, you know, then Jerry took it to that, you know, other level at, you know, at the end of his career where he was really talking about food as medicine. Yeah. And, you know, when he started right. to get sick, he realized that, the, you know, this is the only medicine that you won't want to take, but I'm fascinated by your story about you eating all this organic uh, food and still not feeling good. And obviously, and I, I kind of interrupted you, but I assume you're going to go down this road of saying you started to really look at this, the soil connection to your food and yes. make some changes in the soil. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just because it's a cucumber and tastes like a cucumber doesn't right. mean it's, <laughs> it's good for you. Yeah. You know, yeah, it doesn't yeah. Have, because all the receptor sites that we have in our body needs what it needs, right? Yeah. And uh, and how different plants concentrate different minerals, and uh, you know, so that's uh, that was some of the the things that uh, you know I I brought back from Acres too, and that spirit, you know, a lot of great presenters that would speak to that, um, and it was nice to hear all their different points of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Who else did you have come out? Oh, had uh, Dr. Paul Hepperly, had Gary Zimmer. Of course. Uh, uh, let me see, you know, Bob Schaefer, Will yeah. Winter. Well, uh, okay, good. Yeah, well, Spent a week with him in Italy once. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, yeah he's Will, great. <laughs> Will's a piece of work. Yeah, he and, is. Uh, <laughs> what a great guy. Yeah. Um, and then uh, who else do we have? Jeez, uh, um, Elaine Ingham. Oh, did you? On. Yeah. Yeah, had uh, um, Neil Kinsey. Yeah. Yeah. I had Neil out. You know, is that uh, what you started on was uh, hands on agronomy? Yeah. Neil did our soil analysis for um, our microgreen business because I was, you know, we're cutting all these flats. I was spending $200 every eight days on, you know, a, a, a sunshine mix. And, uh, and I'm all these piles, you know, are starting to, and I want, I used it, but it wasn't all, you know, they would come up all uneven and everything. So I, I gave, I took a sample got to Neil and, and he gave me recommendations and like night and day, all of a sudden, man, we're getting, yeah. you know, full trays and, and it was wonderful. So I saved, you know, uh, so much money on that. It was, it became a no brainer. That's a great yeah. point because if you do this stuff right, I and mean, we talk about that, even in the golf course industry, if you do right. this all right, you're going to reduce inputs. You're going to save money. Yeah, and if you get it right on the small scale, you can do it on any scale. Right, exactly. And we're we're starting to really see that. I mean, Kiss the Ground is really kind of showing that. And people right. like Gabe Brown, who we met, you probably have met Gabe at yeah. Acres. Yeah, I we remember, had Gabe uh, out here. We had oh, Gabe did you? I, I, Gabe, yeah. I remember a couple nights. I remember one very funny night in, in, I think, Columbus, Ohio. 
Jerry, uh, that might have been the same night that Jerry did the, uh, I got to get, you know, he was hiding in the corner. And we went out to dinner with Will and with Gabe and uh, and Lisa and Jerry. And I'm sure there was probably somebody else at that table, but it was great. I sat next to Gabe and we chatted for quite a while. And uh, and he's just a fascinating guy. And he's, you know, yeah. he's now a rock star in the uh, sustainable ag, yeah, right. generative ag world. Uh, right. But right. Uh, so, you know, it's funny because I, I taught at, at Rutgers for 10 years in the soils program. And the book that I used as my textbook was Neil Kinsey's Hands On Agronomy. Yeah, Neil's you know, brilliant guy. He's And, very, you know, and I, I did too. I think I did his class twice. And I've yeah. sent most of my uh, my agronomists here at Earthworks through his class. It's fascinating. I mean, yeah. Neil Kinsey was one of the original you know, and it's funny because, and I, I don't know if you know this, but we deal with academia and academia in, in the turf side of the world hates, they hates the idea of balancing soils because they yeah. just can't put their hands around. The concept of base saturation to academia in right. our world is so foreign. <laughs> they just can't figure it out. And and to their credit, uh, I mean, a lot of our soils in, in our industry are are constructed soils or sand based. So base saturation right. doesn't work in sand. We don't use it in right. sand, but right. we do use it on high CEC soils where there's a lot of minerals. And then okay. obviously you kind of uh, figured that out. What was the aha moment for you when you, when you, especially in reference to this, this balancing soils concept, where was the aha moment? Was it when Neil started looking at some of your stuff or was there a particular yeah. conversation? When, we got the results, you had? when I start saving $200 a week, Wow, that's pretty substantial. You know? Yeah, and and you know, uh, yeah, and and it's a thing where, um, you know, and and as we further go down this road, managing the rhizosphere, yeah, you know, looking at it from the point of view of managing growing the rhizosphere as opposed to growing the plant, and I think that's where a lot of farmers were making, uh, you know, especially guys that are getting on big pieces of the land, mm -hmm. they didn't have the ability or the luxury to grow their soil first. You know, yeah. and and that, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, you talk about my uh, growing into my career here. I one of the things that really resonated strong with me, and that's why I started the Farmers Union, was to have a voice here in Hawaii, uh, because I noticed that I was in the I was on the Farm Bureau for a few years here trying to make a difference here locally. Yeah. And um, and I remember Chuck Walters, I said, Chuck. Tell me about the Farm Bureau, will you? And he goes, Vince, Farm Bureau was organized to keep farmers from becoming organized. <laughs> <laughs> One sentence. Sounds you know. like Chuck. Yeah. And so, and so um, uh, I said, I, in my frustration, you know, I talked to Jerry and Jerry says, well, why don't you get a chapter of the National Farmers Union out there? And I never even heard of them. So it was actually Jerry would instigate through me. Shocking. You know, yeah. And yeah. so that's so I went down the road and to get to get the chapter going here in Hawaii. And actually it's chartered uh, under National Farmers Union now. Oh before, wow, that's good. Yeah, in my in my leadership, I was able to get it chartered. Now, of course, it wasn't just me, there's a lot of people involved, but you know, I was a driving force for a lot of years uh with that that organization. Um and the the, the point to it was that here we are in Hawaii, people don't realize that we bring in 90% of our food right? and our, and our agricultural budget. I, I love this. Every time I ask somebody, how much percentage do you think is our agricultural budget here in Hawaii? People will tell me 20%, 30%, 0.4%. You're kidding me. No. I know, wow. isn't it a trip? And I sit on the Board of Agriculture and I go in front of the Board of Agriculture, thankfully, because I have that platform, I instigated a soil health initiative with the agricultural industry a year before I left Farmers Union. And um, and and I, I instigated it with the head of, head of NRCS here, Travis Thomason at the time. And it was great. Travis and I were just like moving energy around it. We would bring the whole agricultural sector to the table. And the first question I said to them was, do you value soil health? And the head of the Farm Bureau said, well, as long as it makes economic sense. You right. Know, as long as I don't have to spend any more money. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a, that's a Jerry right. story I'm going to talk to you about before we leave today. But the, the um, and so uh, the point being, though, is that, um, I said, people look to us to lead here in Hawaii. How are we leading? 
you know, yeah. when we're bringing in 90% of our food. People that come here thinking they're, they're eating locally produced food. Now, Jerry made a great point uh, along the way. And he said that, you know, the difficulty in Hawaii with Hawaii soils is that we're trying to grow European plants without European soils. Right, exactly. And so that really resonated with me in the spirit of how difficult it is to have this continuous production system going on here with these fragile young soils that we do have, you know, in that spirit. So I, uh, but but getting back to the whole idea of Hawaii and, and not leading in agriculture, I've been, you know, I've been like this voice is going, well, why aren't we utilizing the government? If they're only going to give us 0.4%, well, why don't we just utilize them for policy? You know, let's let's get the government to create policy that will invite in the private sector. Were okay? they supportive of the idea of, of supporting agriculture? I mean, w w did they look the, the local government think that point four is nuts? I mean, there's how sustainable no, is that? There's, there's no farmers in the legislature. Right. They have no Obviously. idea. You know, how can you take anybody anywhere you haven't been to yourself? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know. I, I just take it as a grain of salt with them. I try to, you know, work with them, bring them along in the spirit of of not making them wrong, you know, but at right. the same time, I, I, encouraging them to, you know, further understand the value of growing our own food here, the multiplier effect that's created locally, economically because of that. You know, we had a uh, we had a, 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 a agricultural salon back in 2010. Jerry came and uh, Cindy, Cindy. Um, um dave uh cindy daly uh, daly thank you yeah. cindy from, daly. Uh, chico, from chico state yeah, yeah she's wonderful, what a beautiful, wonderful what a beautiful lady beautiful human being a, a beautiful like a, a female version of jerry you know yes, really, she was. you know yeah, yeah just and wonderful uh and, and and so cindy uh and jerry were here for that and 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 was a week we spent at a retreat center you know, this, the designing what would an agricultural system look like here in Hawaii and created this network of networks that would be needed and, uh, you know, all that work. We, it was done back in 2010. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I said, so why, don't, why don't we invite in the private sector, have, have policies that, that we could have these guys that are worth billions, you know, invest in an agricultural system here in Hawaii without any return on investment, just as a legacy. You know, because yeah. as the saying go, you know, you, you can't, you don't see a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse, right? right. Yeah, and I so, you know, yeah, well, these guys, you know, they got so much money, right? I'm hearing now Zuckerberg's building an underground bunker, $100 million underground bunker, you know? Well, you might need it soon. Well, yeah, and what's $100 million to him, right? Yeah, exactly. So, oh, you know. anyhow. What a legacy. Uh, the the Jerry story. <laughs> Jerry. Oh my God. There's so we gotta get to some of the stories because it's it's we're we're getting close to time here. Yeah, do it. Well go, go. So you know, I mean, there's so there's so many of them. Oh I know. Uh, uh I you know, I said to him, I was frustrated and I said to him about the uh uh you know about soil health and that falling on deaf ears and, and he said, Well, why don't you get a committee? under the National Farmers Union. And that's how I started the Ralph Committee. Okay. The Ralph Committee? The Ralph Committee, right? Which stands and for? Regenerative Agricultural um, uh, Life? Local Food. Yeah. Regenerative Agriculture Local Food Committee. Local Food. Okay. Ralph. Ralph. Right. I like it was, that. It was, yeah. And what I would do was, and so the the president, I wasn't, we weren't chartered at the time. And I went to the national board meeting. I didn't have a vote. And I went to the president. And I asked him about it. But because we were growing so quickly here in Hawaii, he brought up a motion to the floor to start a committee on soil health, you know, or regenerative agriculture, local food. And he uh, 13 presidents signed on to be on the committee. And he turned around and made me the chair. And from that point on, four times a year, I'd be going to the mainland for board meetings. And I would pull from wherever we were at that board meetings, I would pull people from them, from that county who were doing regenerative agricultural practices and who were doing local food uh, uh, movement, you know, whether it be markets or whatever. And I bring them to the board, uh, to their, to our committee meeting, and we would sit down and discuss. And we've got to a point to where we are actually almost going to get it funded, you know, really, uh, 
Yeah. So, you know, Jerry instigated that. He put the seed in my head yeah. and I was, just, I was the one that followed through. I would, you know, that was, that was Jerry. He, you know, he told Fred Walters who to bring the acres, you know, yeah, I mean, of course he did. Know, Jerry, Jerry just orchestrated the whole yeah. thing. And, and, and you loved, I loved running with it because it made sense. What well, he was he knew you were a good seed bed, you know, he, yeah, he knew exactly. he could plant a seed in, in you and things. And would I would follow through. through. I would run with it. Exactly. You know? And, and so, you know, we, we became very close. We were, you know, people thought we were actually blood brothers kind of thing. At well, you're both Sicilian for God's sake. Of course. Yeah, exactly. There's you know? blood there. You know, yeah, he would say to me, he said, you're not Italian, you're Sicilian. And yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, so, uh, uh, Lawrence Mayhew, we went to, you know, that, that creamery in Indiana. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Well, we, at Acres, we went to dinner at that creamery. I was Mayhew, with you. Please. Oh, I you went, were there. I was, I was there. Yeah. Oh, geez. <clears throat> we were all there. We were a whole group. Yeah. We had a big group there. About 20 of us. Well, yeah. remember the lady was looking for Jerry Brunetti. And, oh, what, and the red dress? pointed to Lawrence. Yeah. He said, yeah, there's, there's Jerry. And she yeah. goes, up the she goes up and she starts talking to she starts talking to Lawrence as if he's Jerry Vernetti. Yeah. Well, oh, he had to he had to divert or or he would have been like trapped. That's all right. The time. You were there. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. That's funny. That was a it was one of the funniest times. But yeah. Oh was, yeah. And he was oh, so yeah. quick at that. It was just like, you know, it was his wit and, and humor. He was so quick. Right. So having that Ralph committee. I love uh, the name a, Ralph. What pertinent, <laughs> yeah, what a pertinent. pertinent what a pertinent name. People didn't want that because they thought, you know, you're, you're puking Ralph. You know? Yeah, exactly. But exactly. Was, but that was Jerry's. Not a good name around food, I guess. Yeah, that was Jerry's uh, stick of uh, the Eddie Murphy routine. You know? Yeah, exactly. Which he boy, did constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Hey, boy. That's right. You know, and so and so it, it was very poignant that it would be called Ralph and, and set up in that way. And I, I'm, I'm saddened that I'm no longer in that boardroom because... You know, I don't think anything's happening with the committee as as it continuing. Um, you know, the National Farmers Union had a great opportunity to really separate That's itself happened, from yeah. the farm bureau. And How's it, how how is the whole uh, agriculture uh, going in Hawaii? I mean, has it grown? Uh, are there more farmers? Are 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 there more yeah. root farmers? I mean, what's yeah, it, the what's, local what's the scene the like now? Movement. Yeah, the local food movement is growing. Yet since 1998. I look at all the body of work that's been put in since then, and the me the needle hasn't moved as far as I felt it should move. Yeah, yeah. It happens. How do, so how do you feel about the regenerative uh, agriculture movement in the con in, in our in the country as a whole now? I mean, it's it certainly looks like it's starting to take off, and we've got you know kiss the ground, and then you know yes. the sequel to that, which I think was wonderful, and and all the work that we're hearing, and in fact, the, you know even the you know even the uh, you know the agriculture bill has put a lot of money into into you know carbon sequestration and re regenerative agriculture carbon even though offset. they don't they don't know carbon what they're offset. doing yeah carbon what? offset on uh, the offsets, yeah. I have and, a uh, one of our agronomists, Kevin Hicks, is now sitting on the soil conservation board in his community in in you in uh, in uh, uh, where he lives in Coeur d'Alene, and uh, and he asked somebody, so what is you know what's your definition of of carbon? And nobody could explain it, what it was. I mean, it was that that foreign to people that were in right. power in this, and these are right. people now that have been you know uh, you know hand, handed over a ton of money. To help with these carbon offsets and regenerative agriculture, yeah. which, is, yeah. which is a really good step. I mean, I think it's one of the best things that's happened as a whole. Uh, and and you can see the movement is going on. I mean, even even the big companies, Vincent. I mean, we look yes. we, we work with the big fertilizer companies. When Jerry and I started, I remember this one story. Jerry and I were sitting at a trade show booth, one of our first trade shows, and we had little jars of some of our liquid fertilizers and some of the stuff. And Jerry was there. And I remember there was a table, two tables down, and these guys looked over at these two old hippies and, uh, <laughs> and they are like what the hell are these guys they're gonna ruin the industry they're gonna Big ruin oil. the industry and, <laughs> and 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 now companies like the andersons the biggest uh, synthetic fertilizer company you know i don't know if you know this but their big mantra right now is carbon everything is carbon 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 they're adding humic acids to the product which is wonderful it's absolutely right. a great step in the right direction it's a small tiny little step but it's a great step in the right direction but the whole marketing is now carbon 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 and it's like wow 
I, I've heard this story from somewhere in my past. I don't know where <laughs> this came from, but from yeah. 35 years ago, I've been hearing this, but yeah, that's how we were perceived. And, uh, you know, and it was, it, it, you know, it's funny because Jerry just, uh, you know, he'd come to the meetings with a lot of the golf guys and, and, and it was literally flying over their heads and I get it. I mean, I spent years with them and, you know, if I picked up 10%, I'd be happy man. You know, that's how, yeah. how involved his head was with all this stuff right. as you well know, but, right. you know, but it's now coming. I mean, I'm very encouraged and I, I, I continue to want the legacy to continue because I want Jerry's message to continue. His book is well, it's timeless. It's, it's timeless. timeless. And it's, you know, yeah, and, you know that's the beauty. That's the I beauty. say this to my, my team here at Earthworks is that we're still 10 years ahead of our time because of Jerry. Yeah. Uh, you, we're yeah, we're yeah. still just scratching the surface of what, uh, what he brought to the world. Uh, yeah. And, and it's not going to die. I mean, I'm not going to let it die and you're not letting it die. And uh, you know, I mean, I love the fact that every uh, December 28th comes around on his birthday and you post something uh, really memorable and, and, you know, and it brings tears to my eyes. I mean, it's, it was probably one of the biggest losses of my life. I mean, you know, we lose parents, we lose siblings, but losing Jerry was, was just, was difficult. And you know, what's interesting about that too, is that he, he would, he would tell me that he was tired of being with himself. Yeah. So that's his humanistic aspect of who he was. Um, you know, when he was going, when he healed himself of non-Hodgkin's, yeah. the first one with the hyperimmunized milk. I mean, that was in the 90s. Who does People that? People were so afraid of cancer. They were yeah. going, give me whatever you got, you know. And Jerry walks out of that office saying to the guy, you know, asking him for a, for a, a hazmat, you know, a heavy metal. <laughs> you know, and he seems, oh, all these heavy metals you want to put in me? You haven't even asked me what my diet is, you know. So, uh, you know, him walking out of that office and, and taking it upon himself to heal himself with hyper immunized milk, a Merck patent they never used. I mean, yeah. this is brilliance. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, but at the same time, he was still human and, and, and the, the walk he had to walk and, yeah. and, you know, I, I, from, from my point of view and it's just my point of view, but I think the vasectomy, 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 yeah. I can't say what, it either. Now you got me saying that. Is, is what is what? Oh, that's interesting. I had not really thought of that. Yeah, created a lot of his health challenges. Yeah, life. yeah. He well, he also, you know, I think you know this, but he had his appendix taken out as a, a small child. Oh yeah. You there know, so, a, I mean, he was. The, like, they took all his lymph nodes out. They took his own lymph nodes out when he was a baby. Well, we, he doesn't right. need this stuff. They just took right. it out. Like, this is right. in the early, This is in the fifties. They found you know? like a cottage cheese kind of a substance around his appendix. So yeah. they took his appendix out. Then they took his lymph nodes out. And yeah. except for one, I think he only had lymph nodes on his under his armpits, I think it was. Yeah. And they sure took out half him. his intestines at that time. You know, so, so I, mean, I mean, think about like, how far behind the eight ball he was just, you know, coming, exactly. coming into this world. And that's what I was saying. He was, yeah, he was treating a lot of people who were healthier than he was. And yet yeah. they were like parasitic to him. You know, you know, they were so fearful of yeah. living. You know, I remember, just, I remember the day that he was first diagnosed and I was in, we had, I think you remember our little office up in Martin's Creek. Right, he and sure. I had had offices on the uh, either end of the top floor. And uh, I don't know if it was Lisa or somebody told me what had, you know, what was going on. And they, they gave him at that time, this quack doctor gave him six months to live. Yep. And yep. I'm up in my office and I'm bawling my eyes out. And Jerry walks in and goes, what the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? What's the matter with me? You just got six months to live. He goes, I'm not going to fucking die. I'm not going to. You know? And I'm like, well, 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 okay. Uh, uh, I believed you. I mean, I believed everything he said. I, you know, I mean, it's just, it uh, never ceased to amaze me what, what I could learn from that man. But he, how those two cancers, <laughs> how those two cancers played off each other. Yeah. And, you know, you know he what? also was battling uh, Lyme's disease. He had Lyme disease. Yeah, and Lyme. Months, I know. You know. I told him he was going to die of a hangnail. <laughs> right. Exactly. You probably know. probably true. Tripping down the steps or you something know. stupid. I remember he. I had gotten Lyme and then a couple, uh, literally a few months after I had gotten. Now, I had gotten the bullseye, so I knew immediately I had Lyme. I went right to the doctor. They shot me up and I was, you know, God knows what the ramifications have been, but but, you know, Jerry was sitting in the hospital room and and nobody knew what was wrong with him. This is when Lyme was still relatively unknown. 
And, and, and he says, he tells the story that uh, some doctor walks by with a bunch of interns and said, what's wrong with that guy? He goes, well, we don't know. He goes, he's got Lyme's disease. Give him this antibiotic. He was out of there in a day. How about and, that? But he got it a second time. But I, I mean, he said this to me virtually on his deathbed that, you know, he goes, man, I, I think I lost my, I shot my last bullet. I thought I was fighting the Lyme when the cancer had come back. And if, yeah, he had, right. if he had been able to focus his attention on that cancer, I mean, he did the things that he did was just amazing. But, you know, and it really did go back. And Fred and, and Jerry put together that video of food is medicine. And yep. it was really the diet that he was living on during those yep. years that he was, you know, fighting. And, and his whole mantra as food is, is, you know, is medicine is, is yep. I, I think the most powerful statement going. And it goes back to the comment that you started with is that it's about the soil. If you get the soil right, the plants going to, you know, certainly from an agriculture standpoint, I mean, in our world with grass growing turf grass, we're not eating it, but it's still the same thing. We're still trying to keep the plant healthy so Absolutely. that we don't have to spew, you know, chemicals and, you know, we just keep it healthy and it recovers better and all the things work. But, but one of the things that he really drove home more than anything that is as powerful to us as anything that we've ever done as at earthworks is the concept of remineralization, getting yeah. minerals back into a soil and That's getting, true. getting the food that the plant needs to create the strongest food possible. And you're living, That's man. I mean, that's, That's that's kind of it's just such a great and I, I'm so I'm so well, happy and proud of you what you've been able to accomplish in all these well, years. Bless your heart, thank you. And and one other Jerry story I want to I want to tap into here. We got more. We got time. Go go for it. Well, I was I'm in a, I'm in the Farm Bureau. Uh, I'm, I'm an officer of the Farm Bureau, so I was able to get Jerry because we took all the speakers to the Big Island and, and the Farm Bureau convention was happening the weekend after, and so I was able to get Jerry on the docket to speak at the farm bureau convention oh wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was in kona do you, have, do, you have, do you have video of this no i wish oh, i did. man that would have been good really because it, you know he said i know how to talk to the farm bureau he said you got to talk economics yes and uh and so it was uh, seven o'clock they had him on that was the only time slot they had available in the morning seven o'clock in the morning wow and 65 people showed up which I thought was pretty amazing for Farm yeah. Bureau. And so they're yeah. all sitting there and there were some leaders in the crowd too, you know, Farm Bureau and stuff. And so Jerry starts talking about King Corn. <laughs> and and uh, at the end, it opens up a, a question and answer. And and one of the, one of the leaders from uh, PARC, Hawaii Agricultural Resource Center, they, they're basically a chemi, you know, research and she gets up there and she says, um, you know, you talk about these kids, you know, being obese and from all this, you know, they're eating and everything. And, you know, they just need to get off the couch. They need to go exercise. And Jerry, he pauses for a minute and he, and he looks at her and he says, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. You know, you know, you're talking about estrogen, but you know what trumps estrogen? Insulin trumps estrogen. Right. <laughs> She didn't know what the hell. She just kind of like slinked back into her chair. He, he was, was a master of, of, that, of putting he people, you know, of, of putting it in much. perspective. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he paused for a moment. And he just collected himself. Oh, yeah, right. You're talking about estrogen. Well, right. insulin trumps estrogen. So, you know, it's that kind of brilliance that. And 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 with the beautiful thing about his brilliance was he never walked around like I'm brilliant. No, he had no ego. Regular at all. guy, yeah, you know, no a regular guy. Yeah. And I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, just amazing. And, and not even really, you know, I mean, you know, you Sicilians have these tempers. He didn't even have a temper, you know. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you really pissed him off, like he had with his neighbor. <laughs> no, no, he, you know. <laughs> I I've been around, you know, we spent, we went to a Rodale field day when I was visiting back East and staying with Jerry and we went to a Rodale field day, stayed there till four 30 and then jumped in the car. And I drove him and I to Ohio 11 hours for their field day. The next day oh, we wow. got, in, we got in like four in the morning and I had to get up at eight, you know, and we, and, but that was the most, I mean, 11 hours in a car with Jerry Brunetti. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I've done it. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny, like I started this conversation with, I could, you know, I could still, you know, even if he was still here today, he'd be telling me things that I didn't know. And, you know, and I used to, when, you know, as Earthworks got busier and busier, I had less and less time to really spend with him. But I would schedule, like, if I was driving to, from here to Washington, D.C., three, four hours, I would get on the phone with him in the car from the time I leave. I would get off as I pull into whatever, whatever I'm doing. But uh, beautiful. Anyway. I know these conversations are beautiful. I, you know, I actually went to look for conversations I had with him that I had. Oh, let me know. I'd love to see some of those. Well, you know, tape recorder, but I looked at my recorder this morning and it's not there. And so I just don't know. I, don't, I have to go yeah. see if I have hard drives and stuff because I know I saved them. But yeah, yeah they, were, they were great, you know. And uh, one of the things that I feel very um, uh, sad about was how much he loved his Martin Creek land yeah, and how really. much he loved being there. But yet he gave of himself so much in traveling. Yeah, I and know. People don't realize how much yeah, he gave himself, you know, yeah. and, that was, and what he did for people that were sick. I mean, like you were saying, he was sicker than they were. And, and there were so many people that would come to him and, and, you know, he had, he'd fallen in love with a couple of them and, and it just the whole, the whole mantra is just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. With Corey. <laughs> I hate to I tell know. you this, my friend, I think we need to do this again because this has been fun. Yeah. I think we got Sounds more stories good. to tell, but I've got to wrap it up and uh and All right. I love spending the time with you, Joel. It's been a while. Appreciate it, buddy. I let me know when you're back in Philadelphia because I'm gonna want to catch up with you and break bread. Okay, sounds Somewhere good. Yeah, I, I would love I'd love to to do that at some point. Uh, appreciate it. I'll be in touch when I do All right. Sure. And if you haven't subscribed to the Earthworks podcast, please do because we're gonna have a lot of neat things like Vincent's conversation Absolutely. as well. I will Vincent, my brother, thank you so much. Likewise, Joel, and, and you take good care, and, and please, uh, uh, all the best to your family. Absolutely.